Chapter One of A Girl the Limber Lost. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patience Charles. A Girl the Limber Lost by Jean Stratton Porter. To all girls of the Limber Lost in general, and one Jeanette Helen Porter in particular. Characters. Elnora, who collects moths to pay for her education and lives the golden rule. Philip Ammon, who assists in moth hunting and gains a new conception of love. Mrs. Comstock, who lost a delusion and found a treasure. Wesley Sinton, who always did his best. Margaret Sinton, who mothers Elnora. Billy, a boy from real life. Edith Carr, who discovers herself. Hart Henderson, to whom love means all things. Polly Ammon, who pays an old score. Tom Levering, engaged to Polly. Terence O'More, freckles grown tall. Mrs. O'More, who remained the angel. Terence, Alice, and little brother, the O'More children. Chapter 1 Wherein Elnora goes to high school and learns many lessons not found in her books. Elnora Comstock, have you lost your senses? demanded the angry voice of Catherine Comstock as she glared at her daughter. Why, mother? faltered the girl. Don't you why, mother me? cried Mrs. Comstock. You know very well what I mean. You've given me no peace until you've had your way about this going to school business. I've fixed you good enough and you're ready to start. But no child of mine walks the streets of Onabasha looking like a play actress woman. You wet your hair and comb it down modest and decent, and then be off, or you'll have no time to find where you belong. Elnora gave one despairing glance at the white face framed in a most becoming riot of reddish-brown hair, which she saw in the little kitchen mirror. Then she untied the narrow black ribbon, wet the comb and plastered the waving curls close to her head, bound them fast, pinned on the skimpy black hat, and started for the back door. "'You've gone so plumb daffy you're forgetting your dinner,' jeered her mother. "'I don't want anything to eat,' replied Elnora, without stopping. "'You'll take your dinner, and you'll not go one step. "'Are you crazy? Walk nearly three miles and no food from six in the morning until six at night. "'Pretty figure you'd cut if you had your way about things. "'And after I've gone and bought you this nice new pail and filled it as special for the first day.' Elnora came back with a face still whiter and picked up the lunch. "'Thank you, mother. Good-bye,' she said. Mrs. Comstock did not reply. She watched the girl down the long walk to the gate and out of sight on the road in the bright sunshine of the first Monday of September. "'I bet a dollar she gets enough of it by night,' Mrs. Comstock said positively. Elnora walked by instinct, for her eyes were blinded with tears. She left the road where it turned south at the corner of the Limberlost, climbed a snake fence, and entered a path worn by her own feet. Dodging under willow and scrub oak branches, she at last came to the faint outline of an old trail made in the days when the precious timber of the swamp was guarded by armed men. This path she followed until she reached a thick clump of bushes. From the debris in the end of a hollow log, she took a key that unlocked the padlock of a large, weather-beaten old box, inside of which lay several books, a butterfly apparatus, and an old cracked mirror. The walls were lined thickly with gaudy butterflies, dragonflies, and moths. She set up the mirror, and once more pulling the ribbon from her hair, she shook the bright mass over her shoulders, tossing it dry in the sunshine. Then she straightened it, bound it loosely, and replaced her hat. She tugged vainly at the low brown calico collar and gazed despairingly at the generous length of the narrow skirt. She lifted it as she would have liked it to be cut if possible. That disclosed the heavy leather high shoes at sight of which she looked positively ill and hastily dropped the skirt. She opened the pail, took out the lunch, wrapped it in the napkin and placed it in the small pasteboard box. Locking the case again, she hid the key and hurried down the trail. She followed it around the north end of the swamp and then struck into a footpath crossing a farm in the direction of the spires of the city to the northeast. Again she climbed a fence and was on the open road. For an instant she leaned against the fence, staring before her, then turned and looked back. 
Behind her lay the land on which she had been born to drudgery and a mother who made no pretense of loving her. Before her lay the city, through whose school she hoped to find means of escape and the way to reach the things for which she cared. When she thought of how she looked, she leaned more heavily against the fence and groaned. When she thought of turning back and wearing such clothing and ignorance all the days of her life, she set her teeth firmly and went hastily toward Onabasha. At the bridge crossing a deep culvert at the suburbs, she glanced around, and then kneeling she thrust the lunch box between the foundation and the flooring. This left her empty-handed as she approached the great stone high school building. She entered bravely and inquired her way to the office of the superintendent. There she learned that she should have come the week before and arranged for her classes. There were many things incident to the opening of school, and one man unable to cope with all of them. "'Where have you been attending school?' he asked, as he advised the teacher of the cooking department not to telephone for groceries until she saw how many she would have in her classes, wrote an order for chemicals for the students of science, and advised the leader of the orchestra to try to get a professional to take the place of the bass violist reported suddenly ill. "'I finished last spring at Brushwood School, District Number 9,' said Elnora. "'I've been studying all summer. I'm quite sure I can do the first-year work if I have a few days to get started.' "'Of course, of course,' assented the superintendent. "'Almost invariably country pupils do good work. You may enter first year, and if you don't fit, we will find it out speedily.' Your teachers will tell you the list of books you must have, and if you will come with me, I will show you the way to the auditorium. It is now time for opening exercises. Take any seat you find vacant. He was gone. Elnora stood before the entrance and stared into the largest room she ever had seen. The floor sloped down to a yawning stage on which a band of musicians, grouped around a grand piano, were tuning their instruments. She had two fleeting impressions. That was all a mistake. This was no school, but a grand display of enormous ribbon bows, and the second, that she was sinking and had forgotten how to walk. Then a burst from the orchestra nerved her, while a bevy of daintily clad, sweet-smelling things, that might have been birds, or flowers, or possibly gaily dressed, happy young girls, pushed her forward. She found herself plodding across the back of the auditorium, praying for guidance to an empty seat. As the girls passed her, vacancy seemed to open to meet them. Their friends were moving over, beckoning, and whispering invitations. Everyone else was seated, but no one paid any attention to the white-faced girl stumbling half-blindly down the aisle next the farthest wall. So she went on to the very end facing the stage. No one moved, and she could not summon courage to crowd past others to several empty seats she saw. At the end of the aisle, she paused in desperation as she stared back at the whole forest of faces, most of which were now turned upon her. In one burning flash came the full realization of her scanty dress, her pitiful little hat and ribbon, her big heavy shoes, her ignorance of where to go or what to do. And from a sickening wave which crept over her, she felt she was going to become very ill. Then, out of the mass, she saw a pair of big brown boy eyes, three seats from her, and there was a message in them. Without moving his body, he reached forward and with a pencil touched the back of the seat before him. Instantly, Elnora took another step which brought her to a row of vacant front seats. She heard the giggle behind her. The knowledge that she wore the only hat in the room burned her. Every matter of moment, and some of none at all, cut and stung. She had no books. Where should she go when this was over? What would she give to be on the trail going home? She was shaking with a nervous chill when the music ceased and the superintendent arose and, coming down to the front of the flower-decked platform, opened a Bible and began to read. Elnora did not know what he was reading and she felt that she did not care. Wildly, she was racking her brain to decide whether she should sit still when the rest left the room or follow and ask someone where the freshmen went first. In the midst of the struggle, one clean-cut sentence fell on her ear. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Elnora began to pray frantically. Hide me, O God, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Again and again she implored that prayer, and before she realized it was coming, everyone had risen and the room was emptying rapidly. 
Elnora hurried after the nearest girl and in the press at the door touched her sleeve timidly. "'Will you please tell me where the freshmen go?' she asked huskily. The girl gave her one surprised glance and drew away. "'Same place as the fresh women,' she answered, and those nearest her laughed. Elnora stopped praying suddenly and the color swept into her face. "'I'll wager you are the first person I meet when I find it,' she said and stopped short. "'Not that. Oh, I must not do that,' she thought in dismay. "'Make an enemy the first thing I do. Oh, not that!' She followed with her eyes as the young people separated in the hall, some climbing stairs, some disappearing down side halls, some entering doors nearby. She saw the girl overtake the brown-eyed boy and speak to him, and he glanced back at Elnora, and now there was a scowl on his face. Then she stood alone in the hall. Presently, a door opened, and a young woman came out and entered another room. Elnora waited until she returned and hurried to her. "'Would you tell me where the freshmen are?' she panted. "'Straight down the hall, three doors to your left,' was the answer as the girl passed. "'One minute, please, oh, please,' begged Elnora. "'Do I knock, or just open the door?' "'Go in and take a seat,' replied the teacher. But "'What if there aren't any seats?' gasped Elnora. "'Classrooms are never half-filled. There will be plenty,' was the answer. Elnora removed her hat. There was no place to put it, so she carried it in her hand. She looked infinitely better without it. After several efforts, she at last opened the door and, stepping inside, faced a smaller and more concentrated battery of eyes. "'The superintendent sent me. He thinks I belong here,' she said to the professor in charge of the class, but she never before heard the voice with which she spoke. As she stood waiting, the girl of the hall passed on her way to the blackboard, and suppressed laughter told Elnora that her thrust had been repeated. "'Be seated,' said the professor, and then because he saw Elnora was desperately embarrassed, he proceeded to loan her a book and to ask her if she had studied algebra. She said she had a little, but not the same book they were using. He asked her if she felt that she could do the work they were beginning, and she said she did. That was how it happened, that three minutes after entering the room she was compelled to take her place beside the girl who had gone last to the board, and whose flushed face and angry eyes avoided meeting Elnora's. Being compelled to concentrate on her proposition, she forgot herself. When the professor asked that all pupils sign their work, she firmly wrote, Elnora Comstock, under her demonstration. Then she took her seat and waited with white lips and trembling limbs, as one after another the professor called the names on the board, while their owners arose and explained their propositions, or flunked if they had not found a correct solution. She was so eager to catch their forms of expression and prepare herself for her recitation, that she never took her eyes from the work on the board until clearly and distinctly, "'Elnora Cornstalk?' called the professor. The dazed girl stared at the board when tiny curl added to the top of the first curve of the M in her name had transformed it from a good old English patronymic that any girl might bear proudly to cornstalk. Elnora stared speechless. When and how did it happen? She could feel the wave of smothered laughter in the air around her. A rush of anger turned her face scarlet and her soul sick. A hot answer was on her lips. The voice of the professor addressed her straightly. This proposition seems to be beautifully demonstrated, Miss Cornstalk, he said. Surely you can tell us how you did it. That word of praise saved her. She could do good work. They might wear their pretty clothes, have their friends to make life a greater misery than it ever before had been for her, but not one of them should do better work or be more womanly. That lay with her. She was tall, straight, and handsome as she arose. Of course I can explain my work she said in natural tones. What I can't explain is how I happened to be so stupid as to make a mistake in writing my own name. I must have been a little nervous. Please excuse me. She went to the board, swept off the signature with one stroke, then without a tremor she rewrote it clearly. My name is Comstock, she said distinctly. She returned to her seat and following the formula used by the others, made her first high school recitation. The face of Professor Henley was a study. As Elnora took her seat, he looked at her steadily. "'It puzzles me,' he said deliberately. 
how you can write as beautiful a demonstration, explain it as clearly as ever has been done in any of my classes, and still be so disturbed as to make a mistake in your own name. Are you very sure you did that yourself, Miss Comstock? It is impossible that any one else should have done it, answered Elnora steadily. I am very glad you think so, said the professor. Being freshmen, all of you are strangers to me. I should hate to begin the year with you feeling there was one among you small enough to do a trick like that. The next proposition, please. When the hour was gone, the class filed back to the study room, and Elnora followed in desperation because she did not know where else to go. She could not study, as she had no books, and when the class again left the room to go to another professor for the next recitation, she went also. At least they could put her out if she did not belong there. Noon came at last, and she kept with the others until they dispersed on the sidewalk. She was so abnormally self-conscious, she fancied all the hundreds of that laughing throng saw and jested at her. When she passed the brown-eyed boy walking with the girl of her encounter, she knew, for she heard him say, Did you really let that gawky piece of calico get ahead of you? The answer was indistinct. Elnora hurried from the city. She intended to get her lunch, eat it in the shade of the first tree, and then decide whether she would go back or go home. She knelt on the bridge and reached for her box, but was so very light that she was prepared for the fact that it was empty before opening it. There was just one thing for which to be thankful. The boy, or tramp, who had seen her hide it, had left the napkin. She would not have to face her mother and account for its loss. She put it in her pocket and threw the box into the ditch. Then she sat on the bridge and tried to think, but her brain was confused. Perhaps the worst is over, she said at last. I will go back. What would Mother say to me if I came home now? So she returned to the high school, followed some other pupils to the coat room, hung her hat, and found her way to the study where she had been in the morning. Twice that afternoon, with aching head and empty stomach, she faced strange professors in different branches. Once, she escaped noticed. The second time, the worst happened. She was asked a question she could not answer. "'Have you not decided on your course and secured your books?' inquired the professor. "'I have decided on my course,' replied Elnora. "'I do not know who to ask for my books.' "'Ask?' the professor was bewildered. "'I understood the books were furnished,' faltered Elnora. "'Only to those bringing an order from the township trustee,' replied the professor. "'No, oh no!' cried Elnora. "'I will get them tomorrow.' and gripped her desk for support, for she knew that was not true. Four books, ranging perhaps at a dollar and a half apiece. Would her mother get them? Of course she would not, could not. Did not Elnora know the story by heart? There was enough land, but no one to do clearing and farm. Tax on all those acres, recently the new gravel road tax added, the expense of living and only the work of two women to meet all of it. She was insane to think she could come to the city to school. Her mother had been right. The girl decided that if only she lived to get home, she would stay there and lead any sort of life to avoid more of this torture. Bad as what she wished her escape had been, it was nothing like this. She never could live down the movement that went through the class when she inadvertently revealed the fact that she had expected her books to be furnished. Her mother would not get them. That settled the question. But the end of misery is never in a hurry to come. For before the day was over, the superintendent entered the room and explained that pupils from the country were charged a tuition of twenty dollars a year. That really was the end. Previously, Elnora had confessed a dozen wild plans for securing the money for books, ranging all the way from offering to wash the superintendent's dishes to breaking into the bank. This additional expense made the thing so wildly impossible that there was nothing to do but hold up her head until she was out of sight. Down the long corridor, alone among hundreds, down the long street, alone among thousands, out into the country she came at last. Across the fence and field, along the old trail once trodden by a boy's bitter agony, now stumbled a white-faced girl, sick at heart. She sat on a log and began to sob in spite of her efforts at self-control. At first, it was physical breakdown. Later, thought came crowding. Oh, the shame, the mortification! Why had she not known of the tuition? How did she happen to think that in the city books were furnished? Perhaps it was because she had read they were in several states. But why did she not know? Why did not her mother go with her? Other mothers 
but when had her mother ever been or done anything at all like other mothers? Because she never had been, it was useless to blame her now. Elnora felt she should have gone to town the week before, called on someone and learned all these things herself. She should have remembered how her clothing would look before she wore it in public places. Now she knew and her dreams were over. She must go home to feed chickens, calves, and pigs, wear calico and coarse shoes, and pass a library with a vernon head all her life. She sobbed again. "'For pity's sake, honey, what's the matter?' asked the voice of the nearest neighbor, Wesley Senton, as he seated himself by Elnora. "'There, there,' he continued, smearing tears all over her face in an effort to dry them. "'Was it so bad as that now? Maggie has been just about wild over you all day.' She's got nervous her every minute. She said we were foolish to let you go. She said your clothes were not right, you ought not to carry that tin pail, and that they would laugh at you. By gum, I see they did. Oh, Uncle Wesley, sobbed the girl. Why didn't she tell me? Well, you see, Elnora, she didn't like to. You got such a way of holding up your head and going through with things. She thought some way that you'd make it till you got started. Then she begun to see a hundred things we should have done. I reckon you hadn't reached that building before she remembered that your skirt should have been pleated instead of gathered, your shoes been low and lighter for hot September weather, and a new hat. Were your things right, Elnora? The girl broke into hysterical laughter. Right, she cried. Right, Uncle Wesley. You should have seen me among them. I was a picture. They'll never forget me. No, they won't get the chance, for they'll see the same things tomorrow. Now that is what I call spunk, Elnora, downright grit, said Wesley Senton. Don't you let them laugh you out. You've helped Margaret and me for years at harvest and busy times. What you've earned must amount to quite a sum. You can get yourself a good many clothes with it. Don't mention clothes, Uncle Wesley, sobbed Elnora. I don't care now how I look. If I don't go back, all of them will know it's because I'm so poor I can't buy my books. Oh, I don't know as you're so drad and poor, said Senton meditatively. There are three hundred acres of good land with fine timber as ever grew on it. it. Takes all we can earn to pay the tax, and Mother wouldn't cut a tree for her life. Well, then, maybe I'll be compelled to cut one for her, suggested Senton. Anyway, stop tearing yourself to pieces and tell me. If it isn't clothes, what is it? It's books and tuition, over twenty dollars in all. Hum, first time I ever knew you to be stumped by twenty dollars, Elnora, said Senton, patting her hand. It's the first time you ever knew me to want money, answered Elnora. This is different from anything that ever happened to me. Oh, how can I get it, Uncle Wesley? Drive to town with me in the morning, and I'll draw it from the bank for you. I owe you every cent of it. You know you don't owe me a penny, and I wouldn't touch one from you unless I really could earn it. For anything that's passed, I owe you and Aunt Margaret for all the home life and love I've ever known. I know how you work, and I'll not take your money. Just alone, Elnor, just alone for a little while until you can earn it. You can be proud with all the rest of the world, but there's no secrets between us, is there, Elnor? No, said Elnor. There are none. You and Aunt Margaret have given me all the love there has been in my life. That is the one reason above all others why you shall not give me charity. Hand me money because you find me crying for it. This isn't the first time this old trail has known tears and heartache. All of us know that story. Freckles stuck to what he undertook and won out. I stick too. When Duncan moved away, he gave me all Freckles left in the swamp, and as I have inherited his property, maybe his luck will come with it. I won't touch your money, but I'll win some way. First, I'm going home and try mother. It's just possible I could find second-hand books, and perhaps all the tuition need not be paid at once. Maybe they would accept it quarterly. But, oh, Uncle Wesley, you and Aunt Margaret keep on loving me. I'm so lonely, and no one else cares. Wesley Senton's jaws met with a click. He swallowed hard on bitter words and changed the thing he would have said three times before it became articulate. Elnora, he said at last, if it hadn't been for one thing, I'd have tried to take legal steps to make you ours when you were three years old. Maggie said then it wasn't any use, but I've always held on. You see, I was the first man there, honey, and there are things you see that... You can't ever make anybody else understand. She loved him, Elnor. She just made an idol of him. There was that oozy green hole with a thick scum broke and two or three big bubbles slowly rising that were the breath of his body. 
There she was in spasms of agony, and beside her the great heavy log she tried to throw him. I can't ever forgive her for turning against you and spoiling your childhood as she has, but I couldn't forgive anybody else for abusing her. Maggie has got no mercy on her, but Maggie didn't see what I did, and I've never tried to make it very clear to her. It's been a little too plain for me ever since. Whenever I look at your mother's face, I see what she saw, so I hold my tongue and say, in my heart, give her a mite more time. Some day it will come. She does love you, Elnora. Everybody does, honey. It's just that she's feeling so much she can't express herself. You be a patient girl and wait a little longer. After all, she's your mother, and you're all she's got but a memory, and it might do her good to let her know that she was fooled in that. It would kill her, cried the girl swiftly. Uncle Wesley, it would kill her. What do you mean? Nothing, said Wesley, sentence soothingly. Nothing, honey. That was just one of them fool things a man says when he is trying his best to be wise. You see, she loved him mightily, and they'd been married only a year, and what she was loving was what she thought he was. She hadn't really got acquainted with the man yet. If it had been even one more year, she could have borne it, and you'd have got justice. Having been a teacher, she was better educated and smarter than the rest of us, and so she was more sensitive-like. She can't understand she was loving a dream. So I say it might do her good if somebody that knew could tell her, but I swear to gracious I never could. I've heard her out at the edge of that quagmire calling in them wild spells of hers off and on for the last sixteen years and imploring the swamp to give him back to her, and I've got out of bed when I was pretty tired and come down to see she didn't go in herself or harm you. What she feels is too deep for me. I've got to respect in her grief and I can't get over it. Go home and tell your ma, honey, and ask her nice and kind to help you. If she won't, then you got to swallow that little lump of pride in your neck and come to Aunt Maggie like you've been a-coming all your life. I'll ask, Mother, but I can't take your money, Uncle Wesley. Indeed, I can't. I'll wait a year and earn some and enter next year. There's one thing you don't consider, Elnora, said the man earnestly, and that's what you are to Maggie. She's a little like your ma. She has to given up to it, and she's struggling on brave. But when we buried our second little girl, the light went out of Maggie's eyes, and it's not come back. The only time I ever see a hint of it is when she thinks she's done something that makes you happy, Elnora. Now you go easy about refusing her anything she wants to do for you. There's times in this world when it's our bounden duty to forget ourselves and think what will help other people. Young woman, you owe me and Maggie all the comfort we can get out of you. There's the two of our own we can't ever do anything for. Don't you get the idea into your head that a fool thing you call pride is going to cut us out of all the pleasure we have in life beside ourselves. Uncle Wesley, you are a dear, said Elnor, just a dear. If I can't possibly get that money any way else on earth, I'll come and borrow it of you, and then I'll pay it back if I dig ferns from the swamp and sell them from door to door in the city. I'll even plant them so that they will be sure to come up in the spring. I have been sort of panic-stricken all day and couldn't think. I can gather nuts and sell them. Freckles sold moths and butterflies, and I've a lot collected. Of course I'm going back tomorrow. I can find a way to get the books. Don't you worry about me. I am all right. Now what do you think of that? inquired Wesley Sinton of the swamp in general. Here's our Elnora. Come back to stay. Head high and right as a trivet. You've named three ways in three minutes that you could earn ten dollars, which I figure would be enough to start you. Let's go to supper and stop worrying. Elnora unlocked the case, took out the pail, put the napkin in it, pulled the ribbon from her hair, binding it down tight again, and followed out to the road. From afar she could see her mother in the doorway. She blinked her eyes and tried to smile as she answered Wesley Sinton, and indeed she did feel better. She knew now what she had to expect, where to go, and what to do. Get the books she must. When she got them, she would show those city girls and boys how to prepare and recite lessons, how to walk with a brave heart and they could show her how to wear pretty clothes and have good times. As she neared the door, her mother reached for the pail. I forgot to tell you to bring home your scraps for the chickens, she said. Elnora entered. There weren't any scraps, and I'm hungry again as I ever was in my life. I thought likely you would be, said Mrs. Comstock, and so I got supper ready. We can eat first and do the work afterward. What kept you so? I expected you an hour ago. Elnora looked into her mother's face and smiled. It was a queer sort of a little smile, and wouldn't have reached the depths with any normal mother. 
I see you've been bawling, said Mrs. Comstock. I thought you'd get your fill in a hurry. That's why I wouldn't go to any expense. If we keep out of the poorhouse, we have to cut the corners close. It's likely this brushwood road tax will eat up all we've saved in years. Where the land tax is to come from, I don't know. It gets bigger every year. If they are going to dredge the swamp ditch again, they'll just have to take the land to pay for it. I can't, that's all. We'll get up early in the morning and gather and hold the beans for winter and put in the rest of the day hoeing the turnips. Elnora again smiled that pitiful smile. Do you think I didn't know that I was funny and would be laughed at? she asked. Funny, cried Mrs. Comstock hotly. Yes, funny, a regular caricature, answered Elnora. No one else wore calico, not even one other. No one else wore high, heavy shoes, not even one. No one else had such a funny little old hat. My hair was not right, my ribbon invisible compared with the others. I did not know where to go or what to do, and I had no books. What a spectacle I made for them. Elnora laughed nervously at her own picture. But there's always two sides. The professor said in the algebra class that he never had a better solution and explanation than mine of the proposition he gave me, which scored one for me in spite of my clothes. Well, I wouldn't brag on myself. That was poor taste, admitted Elnora. But, you see, it is a case of whistling to keep up my courage. I honestly could see that I would have looked just as well as the rest of them if I had been dressed as they were. We can't afford that, so I have to find something else to brace me. It was pretty bad, Mother. Well, I'm glad you got enough of it. Oh, but I haven't, hurried in Elnor. I just got to start. The hardest is over. Tomorrow they won't be surprised. They will know what to expect. I am sorry to hear about the dredge. Is it really going through? Yes, I got my notification today. The tax will be something enormous. I don't know as I can spare you, even if you are willing to be a laughing stock for the town. With every bite, Elnora's courage rose, for she was a healthy young thing. You've heard about doing evil that good might come from it, she said. Well, mother mine, it's a little like that with me. I'm willing to bear the hard part to pay for what I'll learn. Already I have selected the ward building, which I shall teach in about four years. I am going to ask for a room with a south exposure, so that the flowers and moths I bring in from the swamp to show the children will do well. You little idiot, said Mrs. Comstock. How are you going to pay your expenses? Now that is just why I was going to ask you, said Elnora. You see, I have had two startling pieces of news today. I did not know I would need any money. I thought the city furnished the books, and there is an out-of-town tuition also. I need ten dollars in the morning. Will you please let me have it? Ten dollars, cried Mrs. Comstock. Ten dollars? Why don't you say a hundred and be done with it? I could get one as easy as the other. I told you, I told you I couldn't raise a cent. Every year expenses grow bigger and bigger. I told you not to ask for money. I never meant to, replied Elnora. I thought clothes were all I need and I could bear them. I never knew about buying books and tuition. Well, I did, said Mrs. Comstock. I knew what you would run into, but you are so bulldog stubborn and so set in your way, I thought I would just let you try the world a little and see how you liked it. Elnora pushed back her chair and looked at her mother. Do you mean to say, she demanded, that you knew when you let me go into a city classroom and reveal the fact before all of them that I expected to have my books handed out to me? Do you mean to say that you knew I had to pay for them? Mrs. Comstock evaded the direct question. Anybody but an idiot mooning over a book or wasting time prowling the woods would have known you had to pay. Everybody has to pay for everything. Life is made up of pay, pay, pay. It's always and forever pay. If you don't pay one way, you do another. Of course I knew you had to pay. Of course I knew you would come home blubbering. But you don't get a penny. I haven't one cent and can't get one. Have your way if you are determined, but I think you will find the road pretty rocky. Swampy, you mean, Mother, corrected Elnora. She arose, white and trembling. Perhaps some day God will teach me how to understand you. He knows I do not now. You can't possibly realize just what you let me go through today, or how you let me go, but I'll tell you this. You understand enough that if you had the money and would offer it to me, I wouldn't touch it now, and I'll tell you this much more. I'll get it myself. I'll raise it and do it some honest way. I'm going back tomorrow, the next day, and the next. You need not come out. I'll do the night work and hoe the turnips. 
It was ten o'clock when the chickens, pigs, and cattle were fed, the turnips hoed, and the heap of bean vines was stacked by the back door. End of chapter one. Chapter two of A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two. Wherein Wesley and Margaret go shopping and Elnora's wardrobe is replenished. Wesley sent him walk down the road a half mile and turned in at the lane leading to his home. His heart was hot and filled with indignation. He had told Elnora he did not blame her mother, but he did. His wife met him at the door. Did you see anything of Elnora, Wesley? she questioned. Most too much, Maggie, he answered. What do you say to going to town? There's a few things has to be got right away. Where did you see her, Wesley? Along the old Limberlost Trail, my girl, torn to pieces, sobbing. Her courage always has been fine, but the thing she met today was too much for her. We ought to have known better than to let her go that way. It wasn't only clothes. There were books and entrance fees for out-of-town people that she didn't know about. While there must have been jeers, whispers, and laughing, Maggie, I feel as if I'd been a traitor to those girls of ours. I ought to have gone in and seen about the school business. I'm no man to let a fatherless girl run into such trouble. Don't cry, Maggie. Get me some supper and I'll hitch up and see what we can do now. What can we do, Wesley? I don't just know, but we've got to do something. Kate Comstock will be a handful, while all Nora will be too. But between us, we must see that the girl is not too hard-pressed about money and that she is dressed so she is not ridiculous. She saved us the wages of a woman many a day. Can't you make her some decent dresses, Maggie? Well, I'm not just what you call expert, but I could beat Kate Comstock all to pieces. I know that skirts should be pleated to the band instead of gathered, and full enough to sit in and short enough to walk in. I could try. There's patterns for sale. Let's go right away, Wesley. Well, set me a bite of supper while I hitch up. Margaret Sinton started for the cupboard when she remembered that Wesley had worked all day and was hungry as usual, so she built a fire, made coffee, and fried ham and eggs. She set out pie and cake and had enough for a hungry man by the time the carriage was at the door, but she had no appetite. She dressed while Wesley ate, put away the food while he dressed, and then they drove toward the city through the beautiful September evening, and as they went, they planned for Elnora. The only trouble was, not whether they were generous enough to get what she needed, but whether she would accept what they got and what her mother would say. They went to a large dry goods store, and when a clerk asked what they wanted to see, neither of them knew, so they stepped to one side and held a whispered consultation. What had we better get, Wesley? Dresses, said Wesley promptly. But how many dresses and what kind? Blessed if I know, exclaimed Wesley. I thought you would manage that. I know about some things I'm going to get. At that instant, several school girls came into the store and approached them. There, exclaimed Wesley breathlessly. There, Maggie, like them. That's what she needs. Buy like they have. Margaret stared. What did they wear? They were rapidly passing. They seemed to have so much, and she could not decide so quickly. Before she knew it, she was among them. I beg your pardon, but won't you wait one minute? She asked. The girl stopped with wondering faces. It's your clothes, explained Mrs. Sinton. You look just beautiful to me. You look exactly as I should have wanted to see my girls. They both died of diphtheria when they were little, but they had yellow hair, dark eyes, and pink cheeks, and everybody thought they were lovely. If they had lived, they'd been near your age now, and I'd want them to look like you. There was nothing but sympathy in every girl face before Margaret Sinton. Why, thank you, said one of them. We are very sorry for you. Of course you are, said Margaret. Everybody always has been. And because I can't ever have the joy of a mother in thinking for my girls and buying pretty things for them, there is nothing left for me but to do what I can for someone who has no mother to care for her. I know a girl who would be just as pretty as any of you, if she had the clothes, but her mother does not think about her, so I got to mother her son myself. She must be a lucky girl, said another. Oh, she loves me, said Margaret, and I love her. 
I want her to look just like you do. Please tell me about your clothes. Are these the dresses and hats you wear to school? What kind of goods are they, and where do you buy them? The girls began to laugh and cluster around Margaret. Wesley Sinton strode down the store with his head high in pride of her, but his heart was sore over the memory of two little faces under brushwood sod. He inquired his way to the shoe department. "'Why, every one of us have on gingham or linen dresses,' they said, "'and they are our school clothes.' For a few moments there was a babble of laughing voices explaining to the delighted Margaret that school dresses should be bright and pretty, but simple and plain, and until cold weather they should wash. "'I'll tell you,' said Ellen Brownlee, "'my father owns this store and I know all the clerks. I'll take you to Miss Hartley. You tell her just how much you want to spend and what you want to buy, and she will know how to get the most for your money.' I've heard Papa say she was the best clerk in the store for people who didn't know precisely what they wanted. That's the very thing, agreed Margaret. But before you go, tell me about your hair. Elnora's hair is bright and wavy, but yours is silky as hackled flax. How do you do it? Elnora? asked four girls in concert. Yes, Elnora's the name of the girl I want these things for. Did she come to the high school today? questioned one of them. "'Was she in your classes?' demanded Margaret without reply. Four girls stood silent and thought fast. Had there been a strange girl among them, and had she been overlooked and passed by with indifference because she was so very shabby? If she had appeared as much better than they, as she had looked worse, would her reception have been the same? "'There was a strange girl from the country in the freshman class today,' said Ellen Brownlee, "'and her name was Elnora.' "'That was the girl,' said Margaret. "'Are her people so very poor?' questioned Ellen. "'No, not poor at all, come to think of it,' answered Margaret. "'It's a peculiar case. "'Mrs. Comstock had a great trouble, "'and she let it change her whole life "'and make a different woman of her. "'She used to be lovely. "'Now she is forever saving and scared to death "'for fear they will go to the poorhouse. "'But there is a big farm covered with lots of good timber. "'The taxes are high for women "'who can't manage to clear and work the land.' There ought to be enough to keep two of them in good shape all their lives if they only knew how to do it. But no one ever told Kate Comstock anything and never will, for she won't listen. All she does is droop all day and walk the edge of the swamp half the night and neglect Elnora. If you girls would make life just a little easier for her, it would be the finest thing you ever did. All of them promised they would. Now tell me about your hair, persisted Margaret Sinton. So they took her to a toilet counter, and she bought the proper hair soap, also a nail file, and cold cream for use after windy days. Then they left her with the experienced clerk, and when at last Wesley found her, she was loaded with bundles, and the glint of other days was in her beautiful eyes. Wesley carried some packages also. "'Did you get any stockings?' he whispered. "'No, I didn't,' she said. "'I was so interested in dresses and hair ribbons and a—a—' a, a hat, she hesitated and glanced at Wesley. Of course a hat, prompted Wesley. Then I forgot all about those horrible shoes. She's got to have decent shoes, Wesley. Sure, said Wesley, she's got decent shoes, but the man said some brown stockings ought to go with them. Take a peep, will you? Wesley opened a box and displayed a pair of thick-soled, beautifully shaped brown walking shoes of low cut. Margaret cried out with pleasure. "'But do you suppose they are the right size, Wesley? What did you get?' "'I just said for a girl of sixteen with a slender foot.' "'Well, that's about as near as I could come. "'If they don't fit when she tries them, we will drive straight in and change them. "'Come on now, let's go at home.' "'All the way they discussed how they should give Elnora their purchases "'and what Mrs. Comstock would say. "'I'm afraid she will be awful mad,' said Margaret Sinton tremulously. She'll just rip, replied Wesley graphically. But if she wants to leave the raising of her girl to the neighbors, she needn't get fractitious if they take some pride in doing a good job. From now on, I calculate Elnora shall go to school. And she shall have all the clothes and books she needs if I go around on the back of Kate Comstock's land and cut a tree, or drive off a calf to pay for them. Why, I know one tree she owns that would put Elnora in heaven for a year. Just think of it, Margaret. It's not fair. One third of what is there belongs to Elnora by law, and if Kate Comstock raises a row, I'll tell her so and see that the girl gets it. 
You go to see Kate in the morning and I'll go with you. Tell her you want Elnora's pattern that you are going to make her a dress for helping us. And sort of hint at a few more things. If Kate box, I'll take a hand and settle her. I'll go to law for Elnora's sake of that land and sell enough to educate her. Why, Wesley Sinton, you're perfectly wild. I'm not. Did you ever stop to think that such cases are so frequent there have been laws made to provide for them? I can bring it up in court and force Kate to educate Elnora and board and clothe her until she's of age, and then she can take her share. Wesley, Kate would go crazy. She's crazy now. The idea of any mother living with as sweet a girl as Elnora and letting her suffer till I find her crying like a funeral, it makes me fighting mad, all uncalled for, not a grain of sense in it. I've offered and offered to oversee clearing her land and working her fields. Let her sell a good tree or a few acres. Something is going to be done right now. Elnora's been fairly happy up to this, but to spoil the school life she's planned is to ruin all her life. I won't have it. If Elnora won't take these things, so help me, I'll tell her what she is worth and loan her the money and she can pay me back when she comes of age. I'm going to have it out with Kate Comstock in the morning. Here we are. You open up what you got while I put away the horses and then I'll show you. When Wesley came from the barn, Margaret had four pieces of crisp gingham, a pale blue, a pink, a gray with green stripes, and a rich brown and blue plaid. On each of them lay a yard and a half of wide ribbon to match. They were handkerchiefs and a brown leather belt. In her hands, she held a wide-brimmed, tan, straw hat, having a high crown banded with velvet strips, each of which fastened with a tiny gold buckle. It looks kind of bare now, she explained. It had three quills on it here. Did you have them taken off? asked Wesley dubiously. Yes, I did. The price was two and a half for the hat, and those things were a dollar and a half apiece. I couldn't pay that. It does seem considerable, admitted Wesley, but will it look right without them? No, it won't, said Margaret. It's going to have quills on it. Do you remember those beautiful peacock wing feathers that Phoebe Sims gave me? Three of them go on just where those came off, and nobody will ever know the difference. They match the hat to a moral, and they are just a little longer and richer than the ones that I had taken off. I was wondering whether I had better sew them on tonight while I remember how they set, or wait till morning. Don't risk it, exclaimed Wesley anxiously. Don't you risk it. Sew them on right now. Open your bundles while I get the thread, said Margaret. Wesley sent out the shoes. Margaret took them up and pinched the leather and stroked them. My, but they are pretty, she cried. Wesley picked up one and slowly turned it in his big hands. He glanced at his foot and back to the shoe. It's a little bit of a thing, Margaret, he said softly. Like as not, I'll have to take it back. It don't look as if it could fit. It don't look like it dared do anything else, said Margaret. That's a happy little shoe to get the chance to carry as fine a girl as Elnora to high school. Now, what's in the other box? Wesley looked at Margaret doubtfully. Why, he said, you know there's going to be rainy days, and those things she has now ain't fit for anything but to drive up the cows. Wesley, did you get high shoes too? Well, she ought to have them. The man said he would make them cheaper if I took both pairs at once. Margaret laughed aloud. Those will do her past Christmas, she exulted. What else did you get? Well, sir, said Wesley, I saw something today. You told me about Kate getting that tin pail for Elnora to carry to high school, and you said you told her it was a shame. I guess Elnora was ashamed, all right, for tonight she stopped at the old case Duncan gave her and took out that pail where it had been all day and put a napkin inside it. Coming home, she confessed she was half-starved because she hid her dinner under a culvert, and the tramp took it. She hadn't had a bite to eat the whole day, but she never complained at all. She was tickled to death that she hadn't lost a napkin. So I just inquired around till I found this, and I think it's about the ticket. Decent looking and handy as you please. See here now. Wesley opened the package and laid a brown leather lunch box on the table. Might be a couple of books or drawing tools or most anything that's neat and genteel. You see, it opens this way. It did open, and inside was a space for sandwiches, a little porcelain box for cold meat or fried chicken, another for salad, a glass with a lid which screwed on, held by a ring in a corner, for custard or jelly, a flask for tea or milk, a beautiful little knife, fork and spoon fastened in holders, and a place for a napkin. Margaret was almost crying over it. How I'd love to fill it, she exclaimed. 
Do it the first time just to show Kate Comstock what love is, said Wesley. Get up early in the morning and make one of those dresses tomorrow. Can't you make a plain gingham dress in a day? I'll pick a chicken and you fry it and fix a little custard for the cup and do it up brown. Go on, Maggie, you do it. I never can, said Margaret. I am slow as the itch about sewing, and these are not going to be plain dresses when it comes to making them. There are going to be edgings of plain green, pink, and brown to the bias strips, and tucks and pleats about the hips, fancy belts and collars, and all of it takes time. Then Kate Comstock's got to help, said Wesley. Can the two of you make one and get that lunch tomorrow? Easy, but she'll never do it. You see if she don't, said Wesley. You get up and cut it out, and soon as Elnora's gone, I'll go after Kate myself. She'll take what I'll say better alone, but she'll come and she'll help make the dress. These other things are our Christmas gifts to Elnora. She'll no doubt need them more now than she will then, and we can give them just as well. That's yours, and this is mine, or whichever way you choose. Wesley untied a good brown umbrella and shook out the folds of a long brown raincoat. Margaret dropped the hat, arose, and took the coat. She tried it on, felt it, cooed over it, and matched it with the umbrella. "'Did it look anything like rain tonight?' she inquired so anxiously that Wesley laughed. "'And this last bundle,' she said, dropping back in her chair, the coat still over her shoulders. "'I couldn't buy this much stuff for any other woman and nothing for my own,' said Wesley. "'It's Christmas for you too, Margaret.' He shook out fold after fold of soft gray satiny goods that would have looked lovely against Margaret's pink cheeks and whitening hair. "'Oh, you old darling!' she exclaimed and fled sobbing into his arms. But she soon dried her eyes, raked together the coals in the cooking stove, and boiled one of the dress patterns in salt water for a half hour. Wesley held the lamp while she hung the goods on the line to dry. Then she set the irons on the stove so they would get hot the first thing in the morning. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three Wherein Elnora Visits the Bird Woman and Opens a Bank Account. At four o'clock next morning, Elnora was shelling beans. At six, she fed the chickens and pigs, swept two of the rooms of the cabin, built a fire, and put on the kettle for breakfast. Then she climbed the narrow stairs to the attic she had occupied since a very small child, and dressed in the hated shoes and brown calico, plastered down her crisp curls, ate what breakfast she could, and pinning on her hat, started for town. "'There's no sense in your going for an hour yet,' said her mother. "'I must try to discover some way to earn those books,' replied Elnora. "'I am perfectly positive I shall not find them lying along the road, "'wrapped in tissue paper and tagged with my name.' "'She went toward the city as on yesterday. "'Her perplexity as to where tuition and books were to come from was worse, "'but she did not feel quite so badly. "'She never again would have to face all of it for the first time. "'There had been times yesterday when she had prayed to be hidden or to drop dead.' and neither had happened. "'I guess the best way to get an answer to prayer is to work for it,' muttered Elnora grimly. Again she took the trail to the swamp, rearranged her hair, and left the tin pail. This time she folded a couple of sandwiches in the napkin and tied them in a neat, light paper parcel which she carried in her hand. Then she hurried along the road to Onabasha and found a bookstore. There she asked the prices of the list of books that she needed, and learned that six dollars would not quite supply them. She anxiously inquired for second-hand books, but was told that the only way to secure them was from last year's freshmen. Just then, Elnora felt that she positively could not approach any of those she supposed to be sophomores and ask to buy their old books. The only balm the girl could see for the humiliation of yesterday was to appear that day with a set of new books. "'Do you wish these?' asked the clerk hurriedly, for the store was rapidly filling with school children wanting anything from a dictionary to a pen. "'Yes,' gasped Elnora. "'Oh, yes, but I cannot pay for them just now. Please let me take them, and I will pay for them on Friday, or return them as perfect as they are. Please trust me for them a few days.' The clerk looked at her doubtfully and took her name. "'I'll ask the proprietor,' he said. When he came back, Elnora knew the answer before he spoke. "'I'm sorry,' he said, "'but Mr. Hahn doesn't recognize your name. 
You are not a customer of ours, and he feels that he can't take the risk. You'll have to bring the money. Elnora clumped out of the store with the thump of her heavy shoes beating as a hammer on her brain. She tried two other houses with the same result, and then in sick despair came into the street. What could she do? She was too frightened to think. Should she stay from school that day and canvass the homes appearing to belong to the wealthy, and try to sell beds of wild ferns as she had suggested to Wesley Sinton? What would she dare ask for bringing in and planting a clump of ferns? How could she carry them? Would people buy them? She slowly moved past the hotel and then glanced around to see if there was a clock anywhere, for she felt sure the young people passing her constantly were on their way to school. There it stood, in the bank window in big black letters staring straight at her. Wanted. Caterpillars, cocoons, chrysalids, pupa cases, butterflies, moths, Indian relics of all kinds. Highest scale of prices paid in cash. Elnora caught the wicket at the cashier's desk with both hands to brace herself against disappointment. Who is it wants to buy cocoons, butterflies, and moths? she panted. The bird woman, answered the cashier. Have you some for sale? I have some. I do not know if they are what she would want. Well, you had better see her, said the cashier. Do you know where she lives? Yes, said Elnora. Would you tell me the time? Twenty-one after eight, was the answer. She had nine minutes to reach the auditorium, or be late. Should she go to school, or to the bird woman? Several girls passed her walking swiftly, and she remembered their faces. They were hurrying to school. Elnora caught the infection. She would see the bird woman at noon. Algebra came first, and that professor was kind. Perhaps she could slip to the superintendent and ask him for a book for the next lesson, and at noon— Oh, dear Lord, make it come true, prayed Elnora. At noon, maybe she could sell some of those wonderful shining wing things she had been collecting all her life around the outskirts of the Limberlost. As she went down the long hall, she noticed the professor of mathematics standing in the door of his recitation room. When she came up to him, he smiled and spoke to her. I've been watching for you, he said, and Elnora stopped, bewildered. For me, she questioned. Yes, said Professor Henley. Step inside. Elnora followed him into the room, and he swung the door behind them. At teacher's meeting last evening, one of the professors mentioned that a pupil had betrayed in class that she had expected her books to be furnished by the city. I thought possibly it was you. Was it? Yes, breathed Elnora. That being the case, said Professor Henley, it just occurred to me as you had expected that you might require a little time to secure them, and you are too fine a mathematician to fall behind for want of supplies. So I telephoned one of our sophomores to bring her last year's books this morning. I'm sorry to say they are somewhat abused, but the text is all here. You can have them for two dollars and pay when you get ready. Would you care to take them? Elnora sat suddenly because she could not stand another instant. She reached both hands for the books and said never a word. The professor was silent also. At last Elnora rose, hugging those books to her heart as a mother grasps a lost baby. One thing more, said the professor. You can pay your tuition quarterly. You need not bother about the first installment this month. Any time in October will do. It seemed as if Elnora's gasp of relief must have reached the souls of her brogans. Did anyone ever tell you how beautiful you are? she cried. As the professor was lank, tow-haired, and so near-sighted that he peered at his pupils through spectacles, no one ever had. No, said Professor Henley, I've waited some time for that, for which reason I shall appreciate it all the more. Come now, or we shall be late for opening exercises. So Elnora entered the auditorium a second time. Her face was like the brightest dawn that ever broke over the Limberlust. No matter about the lumbering shoes and skimpy dress just now, no matter about anything, she had the books. She could take them home. In her garret she could commit them to memory if need be. She could show that clothes were not all. If the bird woman did not want any of the many different kinds of specimens she had collected, she was quite sure now she could sell ferns, nuts, and a great many things. Then, too, someone moved over this morning, and several girls smiled and bowed. Elnora forgot everything save her books and that she was where she could use them intelligently. Everything except one little thing away back in her head. Her mother had known about the books and the tuition, and had not told her when she agreed to her coming. 
At noon, Elnora took her little parcel of lunch and started to the home of the bird woman. She must know about the specimens first, and then she would go out to the suburbs somewhere and eat a few bites. She dropped the heavy iron knocker on the door of the big red log cabin, and her heart thumped at the resounding stroke. "'Is the bird woman at home?' she asked of the maid. "'She is at lunch,' was the answer. "'Please ask her if she will see a girl from the Limberlost about some moths,' inquired Elnora. "'I never need ask if it's moths,' laughed the girl. "'Orders are to bring any one with specimens right in. Come this way.' Elnora followed down the hall and entered a long room with high-paneled wainscoting, old English fireplace with an overmantel and closets of peculiar china filling the corners. At a bare table of oak, yellow as gold, sat a woman Elnora often had watched and followed covertly around the Limberlost. The bird woman was holding out a hand of welcome. "'I heard,' she laughed. "'A little pasteboard box or just the bare word specimen passes you at my door. "'If it is moths, I hope you have hundreds. "'I've been very busy all summer and unable to collect, and I need so many. "'Sit down and lunch with me while we talk it over. "'From the Limberlost, did you say?' "'I live near the swamp,' replied Elnor. "'Since it's so clear, I dare go around the edge in daytime, though we are still afraid at night.' "'What have you collected?' asked the bird woman, as she helped Elnor to sandwiches unlike any she ever before had tasted, salad that seemed to be made of many familiar things, but you were only sure of celery and apples and a cup of hot chocolate that would have delighted any hungry schoolgirl. Elnora said, "'Thank you,' and set the things before her, but her eyes were on the bird woman's face. "'I am afraid I am bothering you for nothing and imposing on you,' she said. "'That collected frightens me. I've only gathered. I always loved everything outdoors, and so I made friends and playmates of them. When I learned that the moths die so soon, I saved them especially, because there seemed no wickedness in it. "'I have thought the same thing,' said the bird woman encouragingly. Then, because the girl could not eat until she learned about the moths, the bird woman asked Elnora if she knew what kind she had. "'Not all of them,' answered Elnora. "'Before Mr. Duncan moved away, he often saw me near the edge of the swamp, and he showed me the box he had fixed for freckles and gave me the key. There were some books and things, so from that time on I studied and tried to take moths right, but I'm afraid they are not what you want.' "'Are they the big ones that fly mostly June nights?' asked the bird woman." Yes, said Elnor, great gray ones with reddish markings, pale blue-green, yellow with lavender, and red and yellow. What do you mean by red and yellow? asked the bird woman so quickly that the girl almost jumped. Not exactly red, explained Elnor with tremulous voice, a reddish yellowish brown with canary-colored spots and gray lines on their wings. How many of them? It was the same quick question. Well, I had over two hundred eggs, said Elnor. But some of them didn't hatch, and some of the caterpillars died. But there must be at least a hundred perfect ones. Perfect? How perfect? cried the bird woman. I mean, whole wings, no down, gone, and all their legs and antennae, faltered Elnora. Young woman, that's the rarest moth in America, said the bird woman solemnly. If you have a hundred of them, they are worth a hundred dollars, according to my list. I can use all that are whole. What if they are not pinned right? quavered Elnora. If they are perfect, that does not make the slightest difference. I know how to soften them so that I can put them into any shape I choose. Where are they? When may I see them? They are in Freckles' old case in the Limberlost, said Elnora. I couldn't carry many for fear of breaking them, but I could bring a few after school. You come here at four, said the bird woman, and we will drive out with some specimen boxes and a price list and see what you have to sell. Are they your very own? Are you free to part with them? They are mine, said Elnora. No one but God knows I have them. Mr. Duncan gave me the books in the box. He told Freckles about me, and Freckles told him to give me all he left. He said for me to stick to the swamp and be brave, and my hour would come. It has. I know most of them are all right, and oh, I do need the money. Could you tell me? asked the bird woman softly. You see, the swamp and all the fields around it are so full, explained Elnora. Every day I felt smaller and smaller, and I wanted to know more and more, and pretty soon I got desperate, just as Freckles did. But I am better off than he was, for I have his books, and I have a mother. Even if she don't care for me as other girls' as mothers do for them, it's better than no one. 
The bird woman's glance fell, for the girl was not conscious of how much she was revealing. Her eyes were fixed on the black pitcher filled with goldenrod in the center of the table, and she was saying what she thought. As long as I could go to the Brushwood School, I was happy, but I couldn't go further just when things got the most interesting, so I was bound I'd come to high school and Mother wouldn't consent. You see, there's plenty of land, but Father was drowned when I was a baby, and Mother and I can't make money as men do. The taxes get bigger every year, and she said it was too expensive. I wouldn't give her any rest until at last she got me this dress and these shoes, and I came. It was awful. Elnora stopped short and stared into the bird woman's face. Do you live in that beautiful cabin at the northwest end of the swamp? asked the bird woman. Yes, said Elnora. I remember the place and the story about it now. You entered the high school yesterday? Yes. It was pretty bad? Pretty bad, echoed Elnora. The bird woman laughed. You can't tell me anything about that, she said. I once entered a city school straight from the country. My dress was brown calico, my shoes were quite heavy. The tears began to roll down Elnora's cheeks. Did they? she faltered. They did, said the bird woman, all of it. I am quite sure they did not miss one least little thing. Then she wiped away some tears that began rolling down her cheeks and laughed at the same time. Where are they now? asked Elnora suddenly. Well, they are pretty widely scattered, but none of them have attained heights out of range. Some of the rich are poor, and some of the poor are rich. Some of the brightest died insane, and some of the dullest worked out high positions. Some of the very worst to bear have gone out, and I frequently hear from others. Now I am here, able to remember it, and mingle laughter with what used to be all tears. For every day I have my beautiful work, and almost every day God sends someone like you to help me. What is your name, my girl? Elnora Comstock, answered Elnora. Yesterday on the board it changed to Cornstock, and for a minute I thought I'd die, but I can laugh over that already. The bird woman arose and kissed her. Finish your lunch, she said, and I will get my price list and take down a memorandum of what you think you have, so I will know how many boxes to prepare. And remember this, what you are lies with you. If you are lazy and accept your lot, you may live in it. If you are willing to work, you can write your name anywhere you choose among the only ones who live past the grave in this world. The people who write books that help, make exquisite music, carve statues, paint pictures, and work for others. Never mind the calico dress and the coarse shoes. Dig into the books, and before long you will hear yesterday's tormentors boasting that they were once classmates of yours. I could a tale unfold. She laughingly left the room, and Elnora sat thinking until she remembered how hungry she was, so she ate the food, drank the hot chocolate, and began the process of getting a grip on herself. Then the bird woman came back and showed Elnora a long painted slip, giving a list of graduating prices for moths, butterflies, and dragonflies. Oh, do you want them? exulted Elnora. I have a few, and I can get more by the thousand, with every color in the world on their wings. Yes, said the bird woman. I will buy them, also the big moth caterpillars that are creeping everywhere now, and the cocoons that they will spin just about this time. I have a sneaking impression that the mystery, wonder, and the urge of their pure beauty are going to force me to picture and paint our moths and put them into a book for all the world to see and know. We Limberlost people must not be selfish with the wonders God has given to us. We must share with those poor, cooped-up city people the best we can. To send them a beautiful book, that is the way, is it not, little new friend of mine? Yes, oh yes, cried Elnora, and please, God, they find a way to earn the money to buy the books, as I have those I need so badly. I will pay good prices for all the moths you can find, said the bird woman, because, you see, I exchange them with foreign collectors. I want a complete series of the moths of America to trade with the German scientists, another with a man in India, and another in Brazil. Others I can exchange with home collectors for those of California and Canada, so you see I can use all you can raise or find. The banker will buy stone axes, arrow points, and Indian pipes. There is a teacher from the city grade schools here today for specimens. There is a fund to supply the ward buildings. I'll help you get in touch with that. They want leaves of different trees, flowers, grasses, moths, insects, bird nests, and anything about birds. Elnora's eyes were blazing. Had I best go back to school or open a bank account and begin being a millionaire? 
Uncle Wesley and I have a bushel of arrow points gathered, a stack of axes, pipes, skin dressing tools, tubes and mortars. I don't know how I ever will wait three hours. You must go or you will be late, said the bird woman. I will be ready at four. After school closed, Elnora, seated by the bird woman, drove to Freckles' old room in the Limperlost. One at a time, the beautiful big moths were taken from the interior of the old black case. Not a fourth of them could be moved that night, and it was almost dark when the last box was closed, the list figured, and into Elnora's trembling fingers were paid fifty-nine dollars and sixteen cents. Elnora clasped the money closely. "'Oh, you beautiful stuff!' she cried. "'You are going to buy the books, pay the tuition, and take me to high school!' Then, because she was a woman, she sat on a log and looked at her shoes. Long after the bird woman drove away, Elnora remained. She had her problem, and it was a big one. If she told her mother, would she take the money to pay the taxes? If she did not tell her, how could she account for the books and things for which she would spend it? At last she counted out what she needed for the next day, placed the rest in the farthest corner of the case, and locked the door. She then filled the front of her skirt from a heap of arrow points beneath the case and started home. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of A Girl of the Limberlust by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four Wherein the Sentence Are Disappointed and Mrs. Comstock Learns That She Can Laugh. With the first streak of red above the Limberlust, Margaret Sinton was busy with the gingham and the intricate paper pattern she had purchased. Wesley cooked the breakfast and worked until he thought Elnora would be gone. Then he started to bring her mother. "'Now you be mighty careful,' cautioned Margaret. "'I don't know how she will take it.' "'I don't either,' said Wesley philosophically. "'But she's got to take it some way. "'That dress has to be finished by school time in the morning.' Wesley had not slept well that night. He had been so busy framing diplomatic speeches to make to Mrs. Comstock that sleep had little chance with him. Every step nearer to her he approached his position seemed less enviable. By the time he reached the front gate and started down the walk between the rows of asters and lady slippers, he was perspiring, and every plausible and convincing speech had fled his brain. Mrs. Comstock helped him. She met him at the door. "'Good morning,' she said. "'Did Margaret send you for something?' "'Yes,' said Wesley. "'She sent me for you. She's got a job that's too big for her, and she wants you to help.' "'Of course I will,' said Mrs. Comstock. It was no one's affair how lonely the previous day had been, or how the endless hours of the present would drag. What is she doing in such a rush? Now was his chance. She's making a dress for all Nora, answered Wesley. He saw Mrs. Comstock's form straighten and her face harden, so he continued hastily. You see, Elnora has been helping us at harvest time, butchering and with unexpected visitors for years. We've made out that she saved us a considerable sum, and as she wouldn't ever touch any pay for anything, we just went to town and got a few clothes we thought would fix her up a little for the high school. We want to get a dress done today mighty bad, but Margaret is slow about sewing and she never can finish alone, so I came for you. And it's such a simple little matter, so dead easy and also between old friends' life, that you can't look above your boots while you explain it, sneered Mrs. Comstock. Wesley Sinton, what put the idea into your head that Elnora would take things bought with money when she wouldn't take the money? Then Sinton's eyes came up straightly. Finding her on the trail last night, sobbing as hard as I ever saw anyone at a funeral. She wasn't complaining at all, but she's come to me all her life with a little hurts, and she couldn't hide how she'd been laughed at, twitted and run face to face against the fact that there was books and tuition unexpected, and nothing will ever make me believe you didn't know that, Kate Comstock. If any doubts are troubling you on that subject, sure I knew it. She was so anxious to try the world, I thought I'd just let her take a few knocks and see how she liked it. As if she'd ever taken anything but knocks all her life, cried Wesley Sinton. Kate Comstock, you are a heartless, selfish woman. You've never showed Elnora any real love in her life. If ever she finds out that thing, you'll lose her, and it will serve you right. She knows it now, said Mrs. Comstock icily, and she'll be home tonight just as usual. Well, you are a brave woman if you dared put a girl of Elnora's make through what she suffered yesterday, and will suffer again today and let her know you did it on purpose. I admire your nerve, but I've watched this since Elnora was born and I got enough. Things have come to a pass where they go better for her or I interfere. 
as if you'd ever done anything but interfere all her life. Think I haven't watched you? Think I, with my heart raw on my breast and too numb to resent it openly, haven't seen you and Mag sit and trying to turn Elnora against me day after day? When did you ever tell her what her father meant to me? When did you ever try to make her see the wreck of my life and what I've suffered? No, indeed, always it's been poor little abused Elnora and cakes, kissing, extra clothes, and encouraging her to run to you with a pitiful mouth every time I tried to make a woman of her. Kate Comstock, that's unjust, cried Senton. Only last night I tried to show her the picture I saw the day she was born. I begged her to come to you and tell you pleasant what she needed and ask you for what I happen to know you can well afford to give her. I can't, cried Mrs. Comstock. You know I can't. Then get so you can, said Wesley Sinton. Any day you say the word, you can sell six thousand worth of rare timber off this place easy. I'll see the clearing and working the fields cheap as dirt, for all Nora's sake. I'll buy you more cattle to fatten. All you've got to do is sign a lease to pull thousands from the ground in oil as the rest of us are doing all around you. Cut down Robert's trees, shrieked Mrs. Comstock. Tear up his land. Cover everything with horrid, greasy oil. I'll die first. You mean you'll let old Nora go like a beggar and hurt and mortify her past bearing. I've got to the place where I tell you plain what I'm going to do. Maggie and I went to town last night, and we got what things Elnora needs most urgent to make her look a little like the rest of the high school girls. Now here it is in plain English. You can help get these things ready and let us give them to her as we want. She won't touch them, cried Mrs. Comstock. Then you can pay us, and she can take them as her right. I won't. Then I will tell Elnora just what you are worth, what you can afford, and how much of this she owns. I'll loan her the money to buy books and decent clothes, and when she is of age, she can sell her share and pay me. Mrs. Comstock gripped a chair back and opened her lips, but no words came. And, Sinton continued, if she is so much like you that she won't do that, I'll go to the county seat and lay complaint against you as her guardian before the judge. I'll swear to what you are worth and how you are raising her, and have you discharged or have the judge appoint some man who will see that she is comfortable, educated, and decent-looking. You, you want it, gasped Mrs. Comstock. I won't need to, Kate, said Sinton, his heart softening the instant the hard words were said. You won't show it, but you do love Elnora. You can't help it. You must see how she needs things. Come, help us fix them and be friends. Maggie and I couldn't live without her, and you couldn't either. You've got to love such a fine girl as she is. Let it show a little. You can hardly expect me to love her, said Mrs. Comstock coldly. But for her, a man would stand back to me now who would beat the breath out of your sneaking body for the cowardly thing with which you threaten me. After all, I've suffered. You drag me to court and compel me to tear up Robert's property. If I ever go, they carry me. If they touch one tree or put down one greasy old oil well, it will be over all I can shoot before they begin. Now see how quick you could clear out of here. You won't come and help Maggie with the dress? For answer, Mrs. Comstock looked about swiftly for some object on which to lay her hands. Knowing her temper, Wesley Sinton left with all the haze consistent with dignity, but he did not go home. He crossed the field and, in an hour, brought another neighbor who was skillful with her needle. With sinking heart, Margaret saw them coming. Kay is too busy to help today. She can't sew before tomorrow, said Wesley cheerfully as they entered. That quieted Margaret's apprehension a little, though she had some doubts. Wesley prepared the lunch, and by four o'clock the pretty dress was finished as far as it possibly could be until it was fitted on Elnora. If that did not entail too much work, it could be completed in two hours. Then the neighbor left, and Margaret packed their purchases into the big market basket. Wesley took the hat, umbrella, and raincoat, and they went down to Mrs. Comstock's. As they reached the step, Margaret spoke pleasantly to Mrs. Comstock, who sat reading just inside the door, but she did not answer and deliberately turned a leaf without looking up. Wesley sent and opened the door and went in, followed by Margaret. Kate, he said, you needn't take out your mat over our little racket on Maggie. I ain't told her a word I said to you or you said to me. She's not so very strong, and she sewed since four o'clock this morning to get this dress ready for tomorrow. It's done, and we came down to try it on all Nora. Is that the truth, Mag Sinton? demanded Mrs. Comstock. You heard Wesley say so, proudly affirmed Mrs. Sinton. I want to make you a proposition, said Wesley. Wait till old Nora comes. Then we'll show her the things and see what she says. How would it do to see what she says without bribing her? sneered Mrs. Comstock. If she can stand what she did yesterday and will today, she can bear most anything, said Wesley. Put away the clothes if you want to till we tell her. 
"Well, you don't take this way sign working on," said Margaret, "for I have to baste in the sleeves and set the collar. Put the rest out of sight if you like." Mrs. Comstock picked up the basket and bundles, placed them inside her room, and closed the door. Margaret threaded her needle and began to sew. Mrs. Comstock returned to her book while Wesley fidgeted and raged inwardly. He could see that Margaret was nervous and almost in tears, but the lines in Mrs. Comstock's impassive face were set and cold. So they sat and the clock ticked off the time. One hour, two, dusk, and no Elnora. Margaret long since had taken the last ditch she could. Occasionally she and Wesley exchanged a few words. Mrs. Comstock regularly turned a leaf and once arose and moved nearer her window. Just when Margaret and Wesley were discussing whether he had not best go to town to meet Elnora, they heard her coming up the walk. Wesley dropped his tilted chair and squared himself. Margaret gripped her sewing and turned pleading eyes to the door. Mrs. Comstock closed her book and grimly smiled. "'Mother, please open the door,' called Elnora. Mrs. Comstock arose and swung open the screen. Elnora stepped in beside her, bent half double, the whole front of her dress gathered into a sort of bag filled with a heavy load, and one arm stacked high with books. In the dim light, she did not see the sentence. "'Please hand me the empty bucket in the kitchen, mother,' she said. "'I just had to bring these arrow points home, but I'm scared for fear I've soiled my dress and will have to wash it. I'm to clean them and take them to the banker in the morning. And, oh, mother, I've sold enough stuff to pay for my books, my tuition, and maybe a dress and some lighter shoes besides. Oh, mother, I'm so happy. Take the books and bring the bucket. Then she saw Margaret and Wesley. Oh, glory, she exulted. I was just wondering how I'd ever wait to tell you, and here you are. It's too perfectly splendid to be true. Tell us, old Nora, said Sinton. "'Well, sir,' said Elnora, doubling down on the floor and spreading out her skirt, "'set the bucket here, mother. "'These points are brittle and have to be put in one at a time. "'If they are chipped, I can't sell them. "'Well, sir, I've had a time. "'You know I just had to have books. "'I tried three stores, and they wouldn't trust me, not even three days. "'I didn't know what in this world I could do quickly enough. "'Just when I was about frantic, I saw a sign in a bank window "'asking for caterpillars, cocoons, butterflies, arrow points, and everything.' I went in, and it was this bird woman wants the insects, and the banker wants the stones. I had to go to school then, but if you'll believe it, Elnora beamed on all of them in turn as she talked and slipped the arrow points from her dress to the pail, if you'll believe it, but you won't hardly until you look at the books, there was the mathematics teacher waiting at his door, and he had a set of books for me that he had telephoned a sophomore to bring. How did he happen to do that, Elnora? interrupted Sinton. Elnora blushed. It was a fool mistake I made yesterday in thinking books were just handed out to you. There was a teacher's meeting last night, and the history teacher told about that. Professor Henley thought it was me. You know I told you what he said about my algebra, mother. Ain't I glad I studied out some of it myself this summer? So we just telephoned and a girl brought the books. Because they are marked and abused some, I get the whole outfit for two dollars. I can erase most of the marks, paste down the covers, and fix them so they look better. But I must hurry to the joy part. I didn't stop to eat at noon. I just ran to the bird woman's and I had lunch with her. It was salad, hot chocolate, and lovely things, and she wants to buy most every old scrap I ever gathered. She wants dragonflies, moths, butterflies, and he, the banker I mean, wants everything Indian. This very night she came to the swamp with me and took away enough stuff to pay for the book's intuition, and tomorrow she is going to buy some more. Elnora laid the last arrow point in the pail in the row, shaking leaves and bits of baked earth from her dress. She reached into her pocket and produced her money and waved it before their wondering eyes. "'And that's the joy part,' she exulted. "'Put it up in the clock till morning, mother. That pays for the books and tuition and—' Elnora hesitated, for she saw the nervous grasp with which her mother's fingers closed on the bills. Then she went on, but more slowly and thinking before she spoke. When I get tomorrow pays for more books and tuition, and maybe a few, just a few things to wear. These shoes are so dreadfully heavy and hot, and they make such a noise on the floor. There isn't another calico dress in the whole building, not among hundreds of us. Why, what is that? Aunt Margaret, what are you hiding in your lap? She snatched the waist and shook it out, and her face was beaming. Have you taken the waist all fancy and buttoned in the back? I bet you this is mine. I bet you so, too, said Margaret Sinton. You undress right away and try it on, and if it fits, it will be done for morning. There are some low shoes, too. Elnora began to dance. 
"Oh, you dear people!" she cried. "I can pay for them to morrow night. Isn't it too splendid? I was just thinking on the way home that I certainly would be compelled to have cooler shoes until later, and I was wondering what I'd do when the fall rains begin." "I meant to get you some heavy dress skirts and a coat then," said Mrs. Comstock. "I know you said so," cried Elnora, "but you need it now. I can get every single stitch I need myself. Next summer I can gather up a lot more stuff and all winter on the way to school. I'm sure I can sell ferns. I know I can nuts. And the bird woman says the grade rooms want leaves, grasses, birds' nests, and cocoons. Oh, isn't this world lovely? I'll be helping with the tacks next, Mother." Elnora waved the waist and started for the bedroom. When she opened the door, she gave a little cry. "'What have you people been doing?' she demanded. "'I never saw so many interesting bundles in all my life. "'I'm scared to death for fear I can't pay for all of them "'and will have to give up something.' "'Wouldn't you take them if you could not pay for them, Elnora?' asked her mother instantly. "'Why, not unless you did,' answered Elnora. "'People have no right to wear things they can't afford, have they?' "'But from such old friends as Maggie and Wesley,' Mrs. Comstock's voice was oily with triumph. "'From them least of all,' cried Elnora stoutly. "'From a stranger sooner than from them, to whom I owe so much more than I ever can pay now.' "'Well, you don't have to,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'Maggie just selected these things because she is more in touch with the world and has got such good taste. "'You can pay as long as your money holds out, and if there's more necessary, maybe I can sell the butcher a calf, "'or if there's things too costly for us, of course, they can take them back. "'Anything they ain't used and can be returned. "'They were only brought here on trial. "'Put on the waist now, and then you can look over the rest and see if they are suitable and what you want.' Elnora stepped into the adjoining room and closed the door. Mrs. Comstock picked up the bucket and started for the well with it. At the bedroom she paused. Elnora, were you going to wash these arrow points? Yes, the bird woman says they sell better if they are clean, so it can be seen that there are no defects in them. Of course, said Mrs. Comstock. Some of them seem quite baked. Shall I put them to soak? Do you want to take them in the morning? Yes, I do, answered Elnora, if you would just fill the pail with water. Mrs. Comstock left the room. Wesley sent and sat with his back to the window in the west end of the cabin which overlooked the well. A suppressed sound behind him caused him to turn quickly. Then he arose and leaned over Margaret. "'She's out there laughing like a blamed monkey,' he whispered indignantly. "'Well, she can't help it,' exclaimed Margaret. "'I'm going home,' said Wesley. "'Oh, no, you are not,' retorted Margaret. "'You are missing the point. The point is not how you look or feel.' It is to get these things in Elnora's possession past dispute. You go now, and tomorrow Elnora will wear calico, and Kate Comstock will return these goods. Right here I stay until everything we bought is Elnora's. What are you going to do? asked Wesley. You'll have to watch me, said Margaret. I don't know yet myself. Then she arose and peered from the window. At the well curb stood Catherine Comstock. The strain of the day was finding reaction. Her chin was in the air. She was heaving, shaking, and strangling to suppress any sound. The word that slipped between Margaret Sinton's lips shocked Wesley until he dropped on his chair and recalled her to her senses. She was fairly composed as she turned to Elnora and began the fitting. When she had pinched, pulled, and patted, she called, "'Come see if you think this fits, Kate.' Mrs. Comstock had gone around to the back door and answered from the kitchen. "'You know more about it than I do. Go ahead. I'm getting supper. Don't forget to allow for what will shrink in washing.' "'I set the colors and washed the goods last night. It can be made to fit right now,' answered Margaret, past the pins between her teeth. When she could find nothing more to alter, she told Elnora to see how quickly she could heat a pail of water. After she had done that, the girl began opening packages. The hat came first. Mother, cried Elnora, Mother, of course you have seen this, but you haven't seen it on me. I must try it on. Don't you dare put that on your head until your hair is washed and properly combed, said Margaret. Oh, cried Elnora, is that water to wash my hair? I thought it was to set the color in another dress. Well, you thought wrong, said Margaret simply. Your hair is going to be washed and brushed until it shines like copper. While it dries, you can eat your supper and this dress will be finished. Then you can put on your new ribbon and your hat. You can try your shoes now, and if they don't fit, you and Wesley can drive to town and change them. That little round bundle on the top of the basket is your stockings. Margaret sat down and began sewing swiftly, and a little later opened the machine and ran several long seams. Elnora was back in a few minutes, holding up her skirts and stepping daintily in the beautiful new shoes. Don't soil them, honey, else you're sure they fit, cautioned Wesley. 
"They seem just a trifle large, maybe," said Elnora dubiously, and Wesley got down to feel. He and Margaret thought them a fit, and then Elnora appealed to her mother. Mrs. Comstock appeared, wiping her hands on her apron. She examined the shoes critically. "They seem to fit," she said, "but they are way too fine to walk country roads." "I think so, too," said Elnora instantly. "We had better take these back and get a cheaper pair." "Oh, let them go for this time," said Mrs. Comstock. "They are so pretty, I hate to part with them. You can get cheaper ones after this." Wesley and Margaret scarcely breathed for a long time. Then Wesley went to do the feeding. Elnora set the table. When the water was hot, Margaret pinned a big towel around Elnora's shoulders and washed and dried the lovely hair according to the instructions she had been given the previous night. As the hair began to dry, it billowed out in sparkling sheen that caught the light and gleamed and flashed. Now the idea is to let it stand naturally, just as the curl will make it. Don't you do any of that nasty, untidy snarling, Elnora, cautioned Margaret. Wash it this way every two weeks while you are in school, shake it out and dry it. Then part it in the middle and turn a front quarter on each side from your face. You tie the back at your neck with a string, so, and the ribbon goes in a big loose bow. I'll show you. One after another, Margaret sent and tied the ribbons, creasing each of them so they could not be returned, as she explained that she was trying to see which was most becoming. Then she produced a raincoat which carried Elnora into transports. Mrs. Comstock objected. That won't be warm enough for cold weather. And you can't afford it, and a coat, too. I'll tell you what I thought, said Elnora. I was planning on the way home. These coats are fine because they keep you dry. I thought I would get one in a warm sweater to wear under it cold days. Then you always would be dry and warm, too. The sweater only cost three dollars, so I could get it and the raincoat both for half the price of a heavy cloth coat. You are right about that, said Mrs. Comstock. You can change more with the weather, too. Keep the raincoat, Elnora. Wear it until you try the hat, said Margaret. It will have to do until the dress is finished. Elnora picked up the hat dubiously. Mother, may I wear my hair as it is now, she asked. Let me take a good look, said Catherine Comstock. Heaven only knows what she saw. To Wesley and to Margaret, the bright young face of Elnora with its pink tints, its heavy dark brows, its bright blue-gray eyes, and its frame of curling reddish-brown hair was the sweetest sight on earth, and at that instant, Elnora was radiant. So long as it's your own hair and comb back as plain as it will go, I don't suppose it cuts much ice whether it's tied a little tighter or looser, conceded Mrs. Comstock. If you stop right there, you may let it go at that. Elnora set the hat on her head. It was just a wide tan straw with three exquisite peacock quills at one side. Margaret Sinton cried out, Wesley slapped his knee and sighed like a blast, and Mrs. Comstock stood speechless for a second. "'I wish you had asked the price before you put that on,' she said impatiently. "'We never can afford it.' "'It's not so much as you think,' said Margaret. "'Don't you see what I did? I had them take off the quills, and I put on some of those Phoebe Sims gave me from her peacocks. The hat will only cost you a dollar and a half.' She avoided Wesley's eyes and looked straight at Mrs. Comstock. Elnora removed the hat to examine it. "'Why, they are those reddish tan quills of yours,' she cried. "'Mother, look how beautifully they are set on. I think they are fine. I'd much rather have them than those from the store.' "'So would I,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'If Margaret wants to spare them, that will make you a beautiful hat. Dirt cheap, too. You must go past Mrs. Sims and show her. She would be pleased to see them.' Elnora sank into a chair because she couldn't stand any longer and contemplated her toe. "'Landy, ain't I a queen?' she murmured. "'What else have I got?' "'Just a belt, some handkerchiefs, and a pair of top shoes for rainy days and colder weather,' said Margaret, handing over parcels. "'About those high shoes, that was my idea,' said Wesley. "'As soon as it rains, low shoes won't do, and by taking two pairs of ones I could get them some cheaper. The low ones are two, and the high ones two fifty, together three seventy-five. Ain't that cheap? That's a real bargain, said Mrs. Comstock. If they are good shoes and they look it. This, said Wesley, producing the last package, is your Christmas present from your Aunt Maggie. I got mine too, but it's at the house. I'll bring it up in the morning. He handed Margaret the umbrella and she passed it over to Elnora, who opened it and sat laughing under its shelter. Then she kissed both of them. She got a pencil and a slip of paper and set down the prices they gave her of everything they had brought except the umbrella, added the sum, and said laughingly, "'Will you please wait till tomorrow for the money? I'll have it then, sure.' "'Oh, Nora,' said Wesley Sinton, "'wouldn't you?' 
Elnora, hustle here a minute," called Mrs. Comstock from the kitchen. "I need you." "One second, Mother," answered Elnora, throwing off the coat and hat and closing the umbrella as she ran. There were several errands to do in a hurry, and then supper. Elnora chattered incessantly, Wesley and Margaret talked all they could, while Mrs. Comstock said a word now and then which was all she ever did. But Wesley sent him was watching her, and time and again he saw a peculiar little twist around her mouth. He knew that for the first time in sixteen years she really was laughing over something. She had all she could do to preserve her usually sober face. Wesley knew what she was thinking. After supper the dress was finished, the plans for the next one discussed, and then the sentence went home. Elnora gathered her treasures. As she started for the stairs, she stopped. "'May I kiss you good night, Mother?' she asked lightly. "'Never mind any slobbering,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I should think you lived with me long enough to know that I don't care for it.' "'Well, I'd love to show you in some way how happy I am and how I thank you. "'I wonder what for,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'Mag sent and picked that stuff and brought it here, and you paid for it.' "'Yes, but you seem willing for me to have it, "'and you said you would help me if I couldn't pay all,' insisted Elnora. "'Maybe I did,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'Maybe I did.' I meant to get you some heavy dress skirts about Thanksgiving, and I still can get them. Go to bed, and for any sake don't begin mooning before me or make a dunce of yourself. Mrs. Comstock picked up several papers and blew out the kitchen light. She stood in the middle of the sitting room floor for a time, and then went into her room and closed the door. Sitting on the edge of the bed, she thought for a few minutes, and then suddenly buried her face in the pillow and again heaved with laughter. Down the road plodded Margaret and Wesley Sinton. Neither of them had words to utter their united thought. "'Done!' hissed Wesley at last. "'Done, Brown! Did you ever feel like a bloomin' confounded donkey? How did the woman do it?' "'She didn't do it,' gulped Margaret through her tears. "'She didn't do anything. She just trusted to Elnora's great big soul to bring her out right. And really, she was right, and so it had to bring her. She's a darling, Wesley, but she's got a tie before her. Did you see Kate Comstock grab that money?' Before six months she'll be out combing the limberlust for bugs and arrow points to help pay the tax. I know her. Well, I don't, exclaimed Sinton. She's too many for me, but there is a laugh left in her yet. I didn't suppose there was. Bet your dollar if we could see her this minute she'd be chuckling over the way we got left. Both of them stopped in the road and looked back. There's Elnora's light in her room, said Margaret. The poor child will feel those clothes and pour over her books till morning, but she'll look decent to go to school anyway. Nothing is too big a price to pay for that. Yes, if Kate lets her wear them. Ten to one, she makes her finish the week with that old stuff. No, she won't, said Margaret. She don't dare. Kate made some concessions, all right. Big ones for her. But she did get her way in the main. She bent some, and if Elnora proves that she can walk out barehanded in the morning and come back with that much money in her pocket, an armful of books, and buy a turnout like that, she proves that she is of some consideration, and Kate's smart enough. She'll think twice before she'll do that. Elnora won't wear a calico dress to high school again. You watch and see if she does. She may have got the best clothes she'll get for a time for the least money, but she won't know it until she tries to buy goods herself at the same rates. Wesley, what about those prices? Didn't they shrink considerable? You begin it, said Wesley. Those prices were all right. We didn't say what the goods cost us. We said what they would cost her. Surely she's mistaken about being able to pay all that. Can she pick up stuff of that value around the Limberlost? Didn't the bird woman see your trouble and just give her the money? I don't think so, said Margaret. Seems to me I've heard of her paying or offering to pay them that would take the money for bugs and butterflies, and I've known people who sold that banker Indian stuff. Once I heard that his pipe collection beat that of the government at the Philadelphia Centennial. Those things have come to have a value. Well, there's about a bushel of that kind of valuables piled up in the woodshed that belongs to Elnora. At least I picked them up because she said she wanted them. Ain't it queer that she'd take the stones, bugs, and butterflies and save them? Now they are going to bring her the very thing she wants the worst. Lord, but this is a funny world when you get to studying. Looks like things didn't all come by accident. Looks as if there was a plan back of it and somebody driving that knows the road and how to handle the lines. Anyhow, Elnor is in the wagon, and when I get out in the night and the dark closes around me and I see the stars, I don't feel so cheap. Maggie, how the nation did Kate Comstock do that? You will keep on harping, Wesley. I told you she didn't do it. Elnora did it. She walked in and took things right out of our hands. All Kate had to do was to enjoy having it go her way, and she was cute enough to put in a few questions that sort of guided Elnora. But I don't know, Wesley. This thing makes me think, too. 
Suppose we got all Nora when she was a baby, and we'd heaped on her all the love we can't on our own, and we'd coddled, petted, and shielded her. Would she have made the woman that living alone, learning to think for herself, and taking all the knocks Kate Comstock could give, have made of her? You bet your life, cried Wesley warmly. Loving anybody don't hurt them. We wouldn't have done anything but love her. You can't hurt a child loving it. She'd have learned to work, be sensible, study, and grown into a woman with us without suffering like a poor homeless dog. But you don't get the point, Wesley. She would have grown into a fine woman with us. She seems as if Elnora was born to be fine. But as we would have raised her, would her heart ever have known the world as it does now? Where is the anguish, Wesley, that child can't comprehend? Seeing what she's seen of her mother hasn't hardened her. She can understand any mother's sorrow. Living life from the rough side has only broadened her. Where is the girl or her boy burning with shame or struggling to find a way that will cross Elnora's path and not get a lift from her? She's had the knocks, but there'll never be any of the thing you call false pride in her. I guess we better keep out. Maybe Kate Comstock knows what she's doing. Sure as you live, Elnora has grown bigger on knocks than she would on love. I don't suppose there ever was a very fine point to anything, but I missed it, said Wesley, because I am blunt, rough, and have no book learning to speak of. Since you put into words, I see what you mean. But it's dinged hard on Elnora, just the same, and I don't keep out. I keep watching closer than ever. I got my slap in the face, but if I don't miss my guess, Kate Comstock learned her lesson, same as I did. She learned that I was in earnest, that I would haul her to court if she didn't loosen up a bit, and she'll loosen. You see if she don't. It may come hard, and the hinges creak, but she'll fix Elnora decent after this, if Elnora don't prove that she can fix herself. As for me, I found out that what I was doing was as much for myself as for Elnora. I wanted her to take those things from us and love us for giving them. It didn't work. And but for you, I'd mess the whole thing and stuck like a pig crossing a bridge. But you help me out. Elnora's got the clothes, and by morning maybe I won't grudge Kate the only laugh she's had in sixteen years. You've been showing me the way quite a spell now, ain't you, Maggie? Then they went out of the night and lay down together with Margaret's hand just touching Wesley's sleeve. Up in the attic, Elnora lighted two candles, set them on her little table, stacked the books, and put away the precious clothes. How lovingly she hung the hat and umbrella folded the raincoat and spread the new dress over a chair. She fingered the ribbons and tried to smooth the creases from them. She put away the hose neatly folded, touched the handkerchiefs and tried the belt. Then she slipped into her little white nightdress, shook down her hair that it might become thoroughly dry, set a chair before the table, and reverently opened one of the books. A stiff draft swept the attic, for it stretched the length of the cabin and had a window on each end. Elnora arose and, going to the east window, closed it. She stood for a minute looking at the stars, the sky, and the dark outline of the straggling trees of the rapidly dismantling Limberlost. In the region of her case, a tiny point of light flashed and disappeared. Elnora straightened and wondered. Was it wise to leave her precious money there? The light flashed once more, wavered a few seconds, and died out. The girl waited. She did not see it again, and so she went back to her books. In the Limberlost, the hulking figure of a man slouched down the trail. The bird woman was at Freckles' room this evening, he muttered. Wonder what for? He left the trail, entered the enclosure, still distinctly outlined, and approached the case. The first point of light flashed in the tiny electric lamp on his vest. He took a duplicate key from his pocket, felt for the padlock, and opened it. The door swung wide. The light flashed the second time. Swiftly his glance swept the interior. About a fourth of her ma's gone. All Nora must have been with the bird woman and given them to her. Then he stood tense. His keen eyes discovered the roll of bills hastily thrust back in the bottom of the case. He snatched them up, shut off the light, relocked the case by touch, and swiftly went down the trail. Every few seconds he paused and listened intently. Just as he reached the road, the low hoot of a screech owl, waveringly prolonged, fell on his ears and he stopped. An instant later, a second figure approached him. "'Is it you, Pete?' came the whispered question. Yes, said the first man. I was coming down to take a peek when I saw your flash, he said. I heard the bird woman had been at the case today. Anything doing? Not a thing, said Pete. She just took away about a fourth of the moths. Probably had the Comstock girl getting them for her. Heard they were together. Likely she'll get the rest tomorrow. Ain't picking getting bare these days? Well, I should say so, said the second man, turning back in disgust. Coming home now? 
"'No, I'm going down this way,' answered Pete, for his eyes caught the gleam from the window of the Comstock cabin, and he had a desire to learn why Elnora's attic was lighted at that hour. He slouched down the road, occasionally feeling the size of the roll he had not taken time to count. He chuckled frequently. "'Feels fat enough to pay,' he whispered. "'Bill, I beat you just about seven minutes.' The attic was too long, the light too near the other end, and the cabin stood much too far back from the road. He could see nothing, although he climbed the fence and walked back opposite the window. He knew Mrs. Comstock was probably awake and that she sometimes went to the swamp behind her home at night. At times a cry went up from that locality that paralyzed anyone near, or sent them fleeing as if for life. He did not care to cross behind the cabin. He returned to the road, passed, and again climbed the fence. Opposite the west window he could see Elnora. She sat before a small table reading from a book between two candles. Her hair fell in a bright sheen around her, and with one hand she lightly shook and tossed it as she studied. The man stood out in the night and watched. For a long time the leaf turned occasionally, and the hair drying went on. The man drew nearer. The picture grew more beautiful as he approached. He could not see as well as he desired, for the screen was of white mosquito netting, and it angered him. He cautiously crept closer. The elevation shut off his view. Then he remembered the great willow tree shading the well and branching across the window at the west end of the cabin. From childhood, Elnora had stepped from the sill to a limb and slid down the slanting trunk of the tree. He reached it and noiselessly swung himself up. Three steps out in the big limb, the man shuddered. He was within a few feet of the girl. He could see the throb of her breast under its thin covering and smell the fragrance of the tossing hair. He could see the narrow bed with its piece calico cover, the whitewashed walls with gray lithographs, and every crevice stuck full of twigs with dangling cocoons. There were pegs for the few clothes, the old chest, the little table, the two chairs, the uneven floor covered with rag rags and braided corn husk. But nothing was worth a glance save the perfect face and form within reach by one spring through the rotten mosquito bar. He gripped the limb above that on which he stood, licked his lips, and breathed through his throat to be sure he was making no sound. Elnora closed the book and laid it aside. She picked up a towel and, turning the gathered ends of her hair, rubbed them across it, and, dropping the towel in her lap, tossed the hair again. Then she sat in deep thought. By and by, words began to come softly. Near as he was, the man could not hear at first. He bent closer and listened intently. "'Ever could be so happy,' murmured the soft voice. "'The dress is so pretty, such shoes, the coat and everything. "'I won't have to be ashamed again, not ever again, "'for the Limberlust is full of precious moths, "'and I always can collect them. "'The bird woman will buy more tomorrow, "'and the next day, and the next. "'When they are all gone, I can spend every minute "'gathering cocoons and hunting other things I can sell. "'Oh, thank God for my precious, precious money. "'Why, I didn't pray in vain after all. "'I thought when I asked the Lord to hide me "'there in that big hall that he wasn't doing it "'because I wasn't covered from sight that instant.' But I'm hidden now. I feel that. Elnora lifted her eyes to the beams above her. I don't know much about praying properly, she muttered, but I do thank you, Lord, for hiding me in your own time and way. Her face was so bright that it shone with a white radiance. Two big tears welled from her eyes and rolled down her smiling cheeks. Oh, I do feel that you have hidden me, she breathed. Then she blew out the lights and the little wooden bed creaked under her weight. Pete Corson dropped from the limb and found his way to the road. He stood still a long time, then started back to the Limberlust. A tiny point of light flashed in the region of the case. He stopped with an oath. "'Another hound trying to steal from a girl!' he exclaimed. "'Most well, likely he thinks if he gets anything it will be from a woman who can afford it, as I did.' He went on, but beside the fences, and very cautiously. "'Swamp seems to be alive tonight,' he muttered. "'That's three of us out.' He entered a deep place at the northwest corner, sat on the ground, and, taking a pencil from his pocket, he tore a leaf from the little notebook and laboriously wrote a few lines by the light he carried. Then he went back to the region of the case and waited. Before his eyes swept the vision of the slender white creature with tossing hair, he smiled and worshipped it until a distant rooster faintly announced dawn. Then he unlocked the case again and replaced the money, laid the note upon it, and went back to concealment, where he remained until old Nora came down the trail in the morning, looking very lovely in her new dress and hat. End of chapter 4